has gone crazy. You need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, Unilever, the firm behind Purcell and Dove Deodorant, have decided to ditch woke virtue signalling. They finally got the message, go woke, go broke. In my take at 10, I'll be exposing the scandal of car crime, which has become a national emergency. My Mark Meets guest is a world-renowned expert on plastic surgery. Is a facelift now like going to the hairdressers? Plus my top pundits and tomorrow's papers. We're live from nine. Well, happy Saturday, one and all. Listen, this programme is all about your opinions. Mark at gbnews.com, drop me a line. It is nine o'clock. On television, on radio and online, in the United Kingdom and across the world, this is Mark Dolan tonight. And a cracking Saturday night in we've got for you. In my big opinion, Unilever, the firm behind Purcell and Dove deodorant, have decided to ditch woke virtue signalling. They finally got the message. Go woke, go broke. My Mark Meets guest is a world-renowned expert on plastic surgery. Is a facelift now like going to the hairdressers? Plus, what does she think I should have done? In the big story, have the West given up on Israel? And in my take at 10, I'll be exposing the scandal of car crime, which has become a national emergency. We're on the highway to hell. So, two hours of big opinion, big debate and big entertainment. It is Saturday night and look, it's Halloween weekend, so why don't we have some fun along the way? Grab something cold and fizzy from the fridge or fire up the kettle, tear open those custard creams or maybe chop up that pumpkin and do something with it to make it edible. Whatever you've got to do, we're going to have fun tonight. My big opinion is on the way. It's all about a victory over woke madness. Find out why after the news and Aaron Armstrong. Thanks, Mark. A very good evening to you from the GB newsroom. Israel's Prime Minister says the next stage of its war with Hamas has begun. Benjamin Netanyahu confirmed ground forces have entered northern Gaza, what he referred to as the stronghold of evil. The enclave has been pounded with artillery fire and airstrikes since last night as Israel launched its heaviest bombardment since the conflict began. Civilians, who've been told to move south for their own safety, remain cut off as all communications are down. It means no new casualty figures have been released by the Gaza Health Ministry. Benjamin Netanyahu's warned the fight against Hamas will be long and difficult. He said Israel's supreme goal is the complete elimination of Hamas. Well, waves of rockets have been fired from Gaza towards southern Israel today, with sirens sounding in its biggest city, Tel Aviv. Well, these pictures show a series of missiles being intercepted by the Iron Dome defences. Some got through, though, landing in Tel Aviv and in the city of Ashkelon. No injuries have been reported. Uh, a group of protesters, though, uh, have gathered in Tel Aviv in an anti-war rally. Well, let's bring you more on that. Uh, they've been rallying outside the Ministry of Defence. Protesters blocked a road in Tel Aviv, holding up banners claiming uh, war has no winners and they were calling for a ceasefire and the return of hostages. Now, earlier, the Prime Minister Netanyahu addressed reports that Hamas had offered to swap its hostages in exchange for the release of all Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. However, Netanyahu says 
It's been considered but would be counterproductive to Israel's objectives. In the UK, tens of thousands of people took to the streets of London earlier, demanding an end to the bombing of Gaza. Uh, two people were arrested following clashes with police near Downing Street. Uh, the Met says an officer was taken to hospital. Elsewhere, more than 200 people staged a sit-in on the concourse of Waterloo Station. Uh, the Met has warned that officers will intervene if protesters are deemed to be supporting terrorism. Former leadership candidate for the SNP, Ash Regan, has defected, joining the ranks of the rival ALBA party. She's become ALBA's first MSP and says her old party's lost its focus on independence. ALBA rivals the SNP as a pro-independence party. It was set up by former First Minister Alex Salmond. Uh, Humza Yusuf, the SNP leader, played down the defection, though, saying it's no great loss, and he's not surprised. And there's been a warning of further flooding for areas of the country still reeling from the effects of Storm Babette. Yellow weather warnings are in place for the east coast of Scotland, Northern Ireland and the south of England. There's been flooding earlier today as a result of heavy rain, high winds as well hitting some parts of the country. In Hastings, a shopping centre had to be evacuated earlier because of flooding and some rail services have been suspended. Well, that's it for the moment. I'll be back with more in about an hour's time. Now it's over to Mark. My thanks to Aaron Armstrong, who returns in an hour's time. Cracking show for you. It is Saturday night. Let's have some fun. Couple of drinkies, maybe just a brew and some biscuits, whatever floats your boat. Got a brilliant team today. Lottie, Callum, Greg, and a brand new director in Harry. Let's make it memorable. On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, Unilever, the firm behind Purcell and Do Dove deodorants, have decided to ditch woke virtue signalling. They finally got the message, go woke, go broke. In the big story, have the West given up on Israel? Plus, following the breakup of Rich and Judy's daughter, uh, Chloe Maidley's marriage to rugby star James Haskell, is love in the spotlight doomed to fail? I'll be asking Britain's most famous celebrity couple, the Hamiltons. My Mark Meets guest is a world-renowned expert on plastic surgery. Is a facelift now the same as going to the hairdressers? And what does she think I should have done? In my Take a 10, I'll be exposing the scandal of car crime, which has become a national emergency. We are on the highway to hell. In a world exclusive, as late Queen Elizabeth's childhood friend slams Meghan Markle and expresses sympathy for Harry, I'll get reaction from the Queen of US showbiz, royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Plus, we've got tomorrow's at front pages at 10.30 sharp with three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script tonight. Jenny Trent Hughes, a brand new star on Mark Dolan tonight. Her trousers and my shirt match. Claire Purcell and Diddy David Hamilton. Tonight, I'll be asking the pundits, does Keir Starmer's chaotic handling of the Israel crisis demonstrate that he's unfit to be prime minister? With irritation around Halloween growing, should Britain put two fingers up to American holidays? And as racy author Jilly Cooper bemoans the disappearance of tough guys, are macho men a thing of the past? Plus, the most important part of the show, your emails. They come straight to my laptop, Mark, at gbnews.com. This show has a golden rule. Do you know what that rule is? We don't do boring. Not on my watch. I just won't have it. So, a big two hours to come. We start with my big opinion. Always good to start with some good news on a Saturday night. And the new boss of Unilever, Hein Schumacher, says his company, which owns Surf, Pot Noodles and Coleman's Mustard, is going to row back on the use of brands to pursue social causes and to indulge in virtue signalling. This is a good development. We've seen the soap maker Lush get into a lather over Israel. We saw Halifax sign up to trans madness with pronoun badges for their staff. And for some strange reason, Ben & Jerry's ice cream had an opinion on Britain's immigration policy. Whatever happened to an ice cream brand being vanilla? Talk about a rocky road. Remember the good old days when companies were there to make money and their main focus was to sell their products rather than wag their finger at you and pursue an often bonkers progressive agenda? Well, the good news is it doesn't work and people are voting with their wallets. 
Disney's ultra-politically correct recent films have bombed at the box office. Gillette insulted and lost their male customers by telling them they were responsible for toxic masculinity. And Bud Light saw a collapse in their share price after a guy identifying as a female who has a history of mocking women was used as the face of the brand. At that point, customers took the view that the marketing for that famously pissy beer was taking the piss. A ridiculous dossier on GB News star Nigel Farage was put together by the NatWest-owned Coots Bank, with countless references to his political views and his support for Brexit. Another egregious example of the politicisation of our corporations. Banks, building societies and other institutions want to change the world. But all we want from them is better customer service. But it's not about the customer. And these companies often don't even behave like businesses anymore, which is why many are losing income. Terrifying ESG policies, that stands for environmental, social and governance, reward businesses for pushing climate alarmism and preaching progressive and often contested ideas like trans ideology, which says you can change your sex, or critical race theory, which goes against Martin Luther King's message of a colorblind society. The globalist wet dream of ESG seeks to embed this divisive and often wacky stuff into the DNA of our biggest companies. Which is why this new intervention from Mr Schumacher is so welcome and ought to bolster his company's share price, which has been tumbling. The poor guy's been sweating so much, he probably needs some of that sure deodorant that his firm makes. What was that about going broke and going woke? You heard me right. Unilever, famous for Domestos, Purcell and Dove Soap, is absolutely right to clean up its act. Bring it on. Your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.com. I'll get to your email shortly, but let's hear from tonight's top pundits. A brand new star on Mark Dolan tonight, Jenny Trent Hughes. Political commentator and former Conservative advisor Claire Pearsall and legendary radio and TV presenter Diddy David Hamilton. Well, listen, Jenny, great to have you on the programme. Thrilled to be here. We've been looking, for this, uh, looking forward to this moment for a long time. Uh, your reaction to this rowing back on woke ideology from Unilever? My son is 29 and he says that the only people who use the terms woke and virtual, signal, virtual signaling are middle-aged people trying to look cool. So let's move that concept Well, I'm to... not cool. Let's, <laughs> let's be clear about that. Have you seen this shirt? Yeah, it, you know, well, well look we at the matching. trousers. <laughs> yeah, so it, a lot of that, it, to me, when people start saying, woke this, woke that, it's like when we all used to say, peace, man. What the heck does that even mean? However, I actually used to be in this business and did a lot of work for Unilever in the day, Doc. We don't have advertising anymore. Mm. Advertising is gone. We now have advertorial. And advertorial is when you give a product a story. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Dove is an absolutely phenomenal success that worked on lots of levels. Now, some of that other stuff that, you know, just does not make any sense at all. Mm, so indeed. it's just it's just bad. It's bad communication skills. Yes, because the Dove campaign was very successful because it dovetailed, no pun intended, with their product because it was aimed at women and exactly. telling women that enjoy your body, you're beautiful. Uh, in whatever shape that body comes. And that's exactly. it with the brand. But exactly. for, for an ice cream brand to have a view on the Rwanda plan feels like a stretch to me. Well, what, what's different about that is Ben and Jerry were always a completely different thing. In America, they were an anarchic, I mean, just completely off the scale. A pair of hippies. Be exactly. They were a pair of hippies, they were a pair of old hippies. And they all they did was talk politics. And when they started doing it, that had never been done before, mm. the concept of politics in relationship to a product. And there were people who wouldn't buy it because they liked this, didn't like that. Now, that's old school. Well, I think Jenny's right to point out Dove as a successful campaign. But Gillette famously told their male customers that they were responsible for toxic masculinity, a very expensive multi-million dollar campaign telling men that they were rubbish. Surprise, surprise, they stopped buying their razors. Uh, in most cases, Claire, we do not want a political lecture from these companies. No, we want the product to do what it says it's going to do, 
And that's about it. You want to know that you're getting a good product at a good price, it's going to do what you need it to do, mm. and that's about it. And th th this is the problem I have with things like Ben & Jerry's. It's ice cream. I used to quite like their cookie dough ice cream. <laughs> then they started going on by the UK immigration system, and you just think, well, hang on a second. Some overpriced sugary stuff that I quite like. Is it worth it? Because that's just put me off having it now. I'll go and have something else. But I also think the problem with things like Gillette going on about toxic masculinity, it's aiming this now at an audience who are younger. My son is actually sitting out in the green room at the moment, very nearly 15 years old. Can, can needs... I name check him? James. Hi, James. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassing, <laughs> embarrassing mother. You know what? I think we should get him on the show because every other member of the family is on GB News. <laughs> yeah. I think it's James's turn yeah. because, of course, your other half is the lovely Nigel Nelson. Indeed, indeed. But, you know, he's looking at these products because he needs to have a razor to keep facial hair mm. under control. You don't want to have a lecture at the same time. You just want a razor that's going to get rid of facial mm. hair. Now, this is actually a concerted effort by you know, groups in Davos and, 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 and other such sort of, you know, beyond government organisations, ESG, environmental, uh, social and, uh, and uh, governance, uh, which, which is a set of policies which essentially tie in with net zero, trans ideology, critical race theory. So there's some pretty controversial stuff that's being sort of infiltrated within these companies, don't you think? I don't have an issue with them looking at the environment and what their company does to, to remove plastic from packaging, for, mm -hmm. for example. I don't also have a problem if you're going to look at social issues and how you're going to address those. What I have a problem with is when they take on one argument, say like the trans debate, and they take one side without giving a balanced view of it and making it that if you don't believe this, then you're wrong. And I think that's where companies get it wrong. Absolutely fine to look at social issues, absolutely fine to look at gender issues, but don't come down as the arbiter of all things right. Uh, David, in the old days, companies used to sell their products. Now they sell a social message. Do we want that? Well, I think once they realise that sales are plummeting, I think they'll, they'll get the message. Um, Unilever, incidentally, another one of their products is Marmite, uh, which <laughs> you either love it or you hate it, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, th I think we don't need the messages. I mean, I, and I think in, in the end they'll realise that, you know, if they're not selling the product, then uh, that's what they need to do. They need to get back to basics. Uh, your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.com. Loving my pundits tonight. Very, very good to have Jenny with us and, of course, Claire and David. Uh, coming up next in the big story, have the West given up on Israel? Plus, following the breakup of Rich and Judy's daughter Chloe Madeley's marriage to rugby star Jamie Haskell, is love in the spotlight doomed to failure? I'll be asking Britain's most famous celebrity couple, the Hamiltons. They're next. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Second best. Marvelissima. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. 
From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's. On GB News, I'm GB News Radio. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big reaction to my big opinion. The industrial giant Unilever, responsible for brands like Dove and Purcell, are rowing back on woke ideology. They're going to get rid of the virtue signalling. It's great news. Uh, a big reaction on email mark at gbnews.com. James says, Mark, ESG, which destroys companies, was introduced by public enemy number one, Tony Blair. This in in indicates the total uselessness of Labour. Woke idiocy is a lefty byproduct. Agnes says, talk about this brand backlash, a rebrand. Why don't you call them the thought police? Uh, Jilly says, uh, fine, this is good news, but Unilever are apparently still selling in Russia. They've become cruelty free and gone non-woke. But until they stop selling in Russia, they are not acceptable. Well, Jilly, uh, thank you for that. I don't know whether Unilever still sell their products in Russia, but you're entitled to your view. I've had a couple of emails on that subject. Elizabeth, well done, Mark. Look after my country, please. Well, Elizabeth, I shall do my best. Ewan says, hey, Mark, I think it's totally right that brands should not be uh, perusing political points. I just want washing up liquid, not to be told this, that and the other. Loving the show. Very well written. Have a great one. Mate, says Ewan. Thank you, Ewan. Uh, Anne says, Mark, William and James Lever from my hometown of Bolton and founders of Unilever must have been spinning in their graves at what's been going on. They were true philanthropists who didn't need to virtue signal. And last but not least, uh, lovely Linda, who says, Mark, have you combed your hair tonight? Linda, I think I have, but let's be honest, I'm fighting a losing battle. Keep those emails coming, mark at gbnews.com. It's time now for the big story. And hundreds of thousands of demonstrators have rallied in cities across Europe and North America this weekend in support of Palestinians as Israel's military widened its air and ground offensive on the Gaza Strip. In one of the biggest marches in London, aerial footage showed large crowds marching through the centre of the capital, demanding the UK government calls for a ceasefire. Whilst the argument that innocent Palestinians should be protected is a compelling one, and who would argue with that, Israel's objective is to defend itself and to eradicate the threat of Hamas, who inflicted the biggest single attack on Jewish people since the Holocaust on October the 7th. But with the public and many high-profile commentators and politicians critical of its response to this crisis, has the West given up on Israel? Let's put that to the formidable political double act of Neil and Christine Hamilton. Uh, Neil, Ukraine has received almost universal support, political, diplomatic and financial, following the Russian invasion. Why not the same for Israel? Well, it's bizarre, isn't it? Because what we're witnessing here is basically the clash of civilization against barbarism. And it's astonishing that we see these vast uh, demonstrations in favor of barbarism. Israel is a beacon of enlightenment and Western values in a sea of failed states, autocratic monarchies and basket case countries. And uh, these people who are marching for so-called free Palestine are basically supporting the kind of world that Israel is surrounded by, which is a total failure in modern humanitarian terms. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm in favor of free Palestine, but Hamas does not uh, in any way represent freedom. You know, it's a mm. death cult organization which is in favor of genocide of, uh, against Jews. 
and that anybody in the West, with the freedoms that we've got, could be supporting the kind of values that this horrific organisation stands for is beyond anybody's understanding, in my view. Well, indeed, I'm labelling it as rebadged Nazism. Now, Christine, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. They share our values of freedom and the rule of law. Their war is our war, isn't it? Yes, indeed, their war is our war. And Jews are the most persecuted nation. They've been persecuted for thousands of years. And yes, their war is our war. They are dying for that war. And the idea that you can even begin to equate what Hamas has done to what the Israelis are doing now in self-defence is, to me, just totally unacceptable and totally ludicrous. There is no parallel. Uh, they are defending themselves. And it's all very well for Hamas and other people and all these do-gooders in the Labour Party to say they shouldn't be doing it. What the hell are they supposed to do? Just sit there and let Hamas take over and push them all into the sea? That's what they're chanting for, from the river to the sea, which means utterly obliterate Israel and chuck the Jews out. That is what they're wanting. And that is what is happening on the streets of London, which I find deeply disturbing, deeply offensive and horrific, frankly. And Indeed, the uh, Neil, however, the, the scenes in Gaza... So, so apologies, uh, uh, Christine. Neil, the scenes Sorry. in Gaza are devastating. Uh, in order to eliminate Hamas, which is the military objective of the Israelis, civilians are going to die. Uh, do you think there is an argument for a ceasefire? No, absolutely not. A ceasefire will only help Hamas. I mean, Hamas is a terrorist organisation. Um, that is defined in law in this country, even though the BBC doesn't seem to recognise this. Mm. And uh, they are firing rockets into Israel even now as we speak. Uh, and the horrific scenes of butchery, which uh, we witnessed three weeks ago, the slaughtering of children, uh, the kidnapping and murder of Holocaust victims in their 80s and 90s, the parading of dead bodies of Israeli women naked and, uh, and, uh, and defiled. Um, these are acts of medieval barbarism. You know, the, in the Muslim calendar, the year is 1444. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a metaphor, I think, for what these people stand for, medievalist uh, uh, darkness as against Western European enlightenment. Uh, and that's what I said earlier on. It's a clash of civilizations, in a sense, Although what we are fighting in in the Middle East is civilization fighting barbarism, yeah, uh, and I don't think it's possible to equate the two in any shape or form. But of course, the problem is complicated now because we have a huge Muslim population in this country, a significant proportion of which turns a blind eye, at the very least, to the kind of activities of organisations like Hamas. And well, I, I, so, I don't know, Neil, if you can say significant portion. We don't know how many Palestinians, uh, Palestinian supporters in this country, how many Muslims support Hamas. You wouldn't be able to put a figure on that, surely? No, of course I can't put a figure on it. But the fact that uh, you know, 100,000 people supposedly today are demonstrating in London, uh, uh, also, uh, you know, fundamentally in favour of what Hamas's objectives are, which is the ceasefire can only help Hamas. Uh, there's no word of criticism by the Muslim Council of Britain uh, for against the atrocities which were committed a few weeks ago. And they, they seek a sort of even-handed view of Israel and the Palestine uh, uh, extremists. You know, there's another organisation, Fatah, which is represented by Mahmoud Abbas in the, on the West Bank of, of Jordan, mm. who don't take the Hamas line. We haven't heard anything about them from these people who are demonstrating in, in the streets. Uh, and uh, you know, this, this is the problem that's now being created. That, of course, w one's got natural human sympathy for people who are suffering from Israeli bombardment. But why are, is uh, Israel bombarding Gaza? It's because it's Hamas controlled. And uh, the, 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 effectively, the majority of people who are living in Gaza have supported Hamas control. Indeed. These underground tunnels, which are being used to attack Israel indiscriminately, uh, the civilian sure. population has been under attack uh, for the last 15 or 20 years. Israel well, withdrew from Gaza in 2005. Mm. And 
that could have been made into uh, uh, you know, a successful uh, a st a separate state, as Israel has been in the last 50 years. But they've decided to seek the path of death and destruction instead of the kind of path which Israel uh, has uh, uh, taken in the last half century, which right. is to create a functioning democracy uh, and you know, a successful capitalist economy in the Middle East. The only one, in fact, the only one. And the only... Uh, the only democracy, of course, Neil, as well. Uh, listen, I take your point. I've been on record as condemning those on marches, uh, calling out uh, the horrible anti-Semitism that we've seen from certain quarters uh, in those demonstrations. But we obviously cannot equate everyone on the marches with support for Hamas. Um, listen, Christine, I want to get to this other showbiz story in just a second. The clock's against us, but you were going to say something about the Labour Party. Oh, was I? Um, you're reading my mind. Well, I mean... Keir I wish I could do that. <laughs> Keir, Keir Starmer's got a major problem on his hand, hasn't he? He's sitting with his backside on a bubbling volcano of his MPs because they are, they are split, just as he thought he was cruising to victory. He's now got a lot of them, because of this issue in, in Gaza, completely divided, and it's showing all the anti-Semitism that was there under Jeremy Corbyn mm. and, um, uh, what's his name, Starmer thought that he'd quashed all that, but he hasn't. And this issue has now brought it bubbling back up. Well, Corbyn I'm really glad you well. mentioned it. I'm glad you mentioned it, Christine, because we're going to be discussing it with my top pundits in just a few oh. minutes. But something can else I, I just, want to ask you I about just, before you go, Christine, can, before you get back to I that bottle think, of, of Shabley. Go, go on, Christine. Can I just say one? I just want to say one more thing about the Gaza situation. If Hamas wanted to show any good intent at all, they could release those hostages. Yeah. They won't. And that, frankly, that to me sums up their bad intent. That's a very Sorry astute observation. You're absolutely right. Well, a developing story now, Christine and Neil, in the world of showbiz. And the daughter of Richard and Judy, Chloe Maidley, has confirmed that she has split from her husband, rugby star James Haskell. The couple who married in 2018 have fueled speculation about their relationship after the personal trainer emerged without her Reading Wing as she partied with friends shortly after Haskell was pictured chatting to a mystery blonde outside a London night spot. Since then, the couple, who star in a reality show about their own lives, have both been seen out on several occasions without their rings. In a joint updated statement shared on Instagram, they said, Chloe and I mutually decided to separate at the end of September 2023. We'd not planned on releasing a statement at this time, certainly not while the television show was airing, but constant speculation about our marriage has unfortunately forced our hand. Now, Christine, you know all about love in the spotlight. Tell me about the pressures of celebrity couples. Well, Neil and I have been married for 40 years. We've been living together for 45, and we met each other over half a century ago. So we've lived through thick and thin, and we took our marriage vows, and we actually genuinely meant them when we said it. And I think too many... I'm not talking about this particular couple because I know nothing about them. I, I didn't even know who she was married to until uh, this evening. Um, I have no idea about them. But I think too many people get married in haste. They don't mm. think about the full implications. They don't really think what they are promising. They are mega promises. They are the biggest promises you will ever make in your life. Yeah, well, I and promise to love, honour and obey. <laughs> I did not promise to obey. <laughs> Absolutely not. So, uh, you know, yes, of course, in the spotlight, but they've brought the spotlight on themselves, haven't they? I mean, they've done, as I understand it, they've done this fly-on-the-wall documentary yeah. about their life. They have invited the whole world to see their marriage from the inside. And I you know, I just read one article in the, in the press about it um, because I knew we were going to be talking about it. They have invited people right into their marriage and... Clearly, their marriage is, is not as... It is extraordinary. They have a baby of 14 months, and apparently it's been falling apart for quite a long time. Mm. What in God's name did they think they were doing getting married in the first place? I mean, if you can't survive the first year or so and producing a baby together, why did you get married in the first place? You must question why. You put your hand up, Mark. Are you about to get divorced? No, well, I want to say thank God that you two got married and thank God that Neil has been <laughs> obeying you ever since. He's absolutely right. Christine is she who must be obeyed, but not her indoors, <laughs> her everywhere, her on GB News. Uh, listen, brilliant to have you oh. both on the programme. 
A match made in heaven will catch up soon. My thanks to Neil and Christine Hamilton. Uh, go and get stuck into that bottle of vino. Lovely to have your company. Aren't they great, those two? And I feel like Neil put that tie on for his appearance this evening, and I'm deeply flattered. Coming up with tonight's pundits, does Keir Starmer's chaotic handling of the Israel crisis demonstrate he's unfit to be prime minister? And with irritation around Halloween growing, should Britain put two fingers up to American holidays? That's next. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. The show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To so join me, Nana a queer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Where did you? It's on your teeth. Your new teeth. I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest. Always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the dinosaur hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Uh, well, let's get back to the big stories of the day with my top pundits. And it feels inevitable that Sakir Starmer will soon call for a ceasefire in Israel, Gaza. He's already begun to walk back the line that Israel has a right to defend itself after 250 Muslim Labour councillors, two Labour uh, mayors and the Scottish Labour leader call for him to change tack. Two powerful factions in Labour pull him, the increasing reliance on the Muslim vote and the return of the Corbynistas. His message is unclear. Labour's stance could be argued to be a mess. So does Keir Starmer's chaotic handling of the Israel crisis demonstrate He's unfit to be Prime Minister. David. Well, that's a very direct question, isn't it? I mean, we've had uh, the Tories in disarray and now Labour in disarray. I mean, they're going to get in, aren't they? It's a, it's a foregone conclusion. But um, uh, apart from his charisma bypass, I don't think anybody really knows what he believes in. Well, listen, let's speak to the man in the know because the political editor of the Daily Express Online, David Maddox, joins us. He wrote about this... In the paper today, a cracking article. I'd urge people to go to the Express website and give it a read. Uh, good evening, David. What was the main thrust of your article today about Starmer and Israel? 
Evening, Mark. Yeah, well, it, it, it was exactly as he said. He has uh, he has lost control of his situation, and I, I think maybe we should give him credit for trying to do the right thing in the first place. But you know, and to defend Israel's right to defend itself, but he is completely. You know, this whole idea that he had somehow got rid of the Corbynistas, that he had taken back control for the kind of sensible politics. You know, the, the Corbynistas are back. The, uh, as you say, he's highly reliant on Muslim votes. You know, his two leading Muslim um, uh, kind of leadership people in the party, Sadiq Khan and, and Asawa, have both come out against, uh, you know, against his policy and in favour of a ceasefire. I'm just looking at the papers tonight, the previews of the papers tonight, which I know will be landing with you soon. You know, he's agreed to weekly meetings with Muslim MPs now. Half his party now have signed up for a ceasefire. It's, uh, it's, he's in big trouble. Well, indeed. I mean, is it only Israel, or does division over the Middle East uh, have wider implications across the policy agenda, the economy, woke issues, uh, energy policy and beyond? Well, uh, we've already seen with Keir Starmer that he can't hold on to a policy for more than a week. You know, he's, he's become Mr U-turn in, in an amazing series of different policies, whether it's energy or you know, private schools or all, all sorts of things. Uh, but and this is all about a matter of, you know, you know it's the criticism of Rishi Sunak is which is too much led by his own MPs. Mm. Essentially, Starmer cannot control his party. And, and if, he, if he falls on this one, on this issue of the Middle East, mm. it may not be a killer on the doorsteps for him, but actually will show the country that he's not in charge. And, you know, he may win the next election, uh, but he will be a prime minister in name only if he is, if he does. And actually, I, I think that this week, if things do go wrong for Labour next year, this week will be the week when people say, actually, the, it began to start falling apart now. David Maddox, fascinating analysis. Do head over to express.co.uk to read David's article. He is the editor of the Daily Express, the political editor of the Express Online. Thank you, David. We'll catch up soon. And good luck putting tonight's paper to bed. Well, uh, let's get reaction now from my other pundits. And Claire Pearsall, what do you think about this? Is, is Starmer already in trouble and he's not even in number 10? This is always going to be a sort of seminal moment for a Labour leader, given the history that they have with uh, Corbyn and his views on Jewish people. So I think that Keir Starmer was always going to find this difficult. He started off, in all fairness, very, very well. He listened to his Muslim MPs, but he supported the Prime Minister, he supported what the government were doing. Unfortunately, he then has to go and sort of re-explain some of his comments when he said that it was right that Israel shut off power to, to Gaza and water. Then he sort of said, well, actually, no, I didn't quite mean that. Uh, they have the right to defend themselves. And, and I think this is where it shows the almost the sort of naivety of him, mm. that you have to be very, very sure of what you're saying, you have to be sure of your position, because the minute you have to go out there and explain yourself, you've lost the message. So I think that... We're seeing an awful lot of those mistakes being made, which, for the Conservatives among us, like myself, you sort of think, OK, well, he isn't ready to be Prime Minister. Now, whether the rest of the country feel like that remains to be seen, but I think that if he can't take these really big decisions right now, then I think that he's in trouble. What will need to happen is he needs to come with, with a firm idea of what he's doing with Muslim councillors and Muslim MPs of his own party who have either resigned or threatened to resign. And I think that's the really important thing. It, does he hold firm and completely get behind the government and, and the, uh, the issues at hand? Or does he bend, fold and give over the power to the Muslim voices within his party. So I think that it's going to be a really rough couple of days and it's really important now what he does. Uh, Jenny, does this story, this prevarication over Israel and the division within the Labour Party demonstrate that if Keir Starmer gets in, it will be five years of chaos? Well, I, I've, I've lived in this country now over 30 years. And in the time that I've lived here, I have voted Conservative, Labour, and Lib Dems and in premier elections. And the one thing that I want is I want to feel that I am voting for someone who, this is a 
a bad analogy, but somebody who can drive the bus, mm. okay? That's what I want. I want somebody who can drive the bus and who has people underneath him or her who also are capable of doing what needs to be done. And sticking to one roadmap, of course. Exactly. Mm. And also being a leader that they are going to listen to. When I look at both parties now, I feel that the people who are in charge could not ride a bus and you know, drive the bus. And in its kind of way, it harkens back to Boris and his bike. Do I, would I prefer Boris on his bicycle than either one of them driving the bus? And Rishi Sunak's probably never been in a bus before. Well, and the people underneath them don't seem to be cohesive. Mm. So they seem to be looking for a way to get their own advantage. So it actually, for me, I think he's in trouble, and it has not way before this, because I don't think that I don't think that he has what it takes. And if I was going to bring in somebody for Labour, I'd do a write-in campaign for David Miliband to come back. Uh, yes, perhaps they chose the wrong <laughs> Miliband all those years ago. Oh no, I said that then. Right, and how history <laughs> might have been different. Uh, listen, what do you think? Uh, Keir Starmer and his people would argue that Labour are streets ahead in the polls, which means that Britain is ready for a change. Uh, Labour would argue that the Tories have destroyed the economy and we've had 13 years of chaos. So what's your view, Mark, at gbnews.com? Uh, briefly, the countdown to Halloween is on with three days to go, with spooky decorations and pumpkins littering the streets and party goers dressed as their favourite pet. Should Britain put two fingers up to American holidays? Claire? No, I, I don't think they should. Um, I'm not a great fan of it, but my village at Halloween is beautiful. There are beautifully done houses with loads of decorations outside, pumpkins and little kids going <laughs> round. And there's a little map that says which houses are going to be decorated, where you can go and knock on the door. And if there are no decorations, no pumpkin, no outside light on, you leave them alone. Don't knock on the door. So do you know mm. what? I think it depends on the area that you live in. We've got young children who live in the village. It's quite sweet. I don't necessarily have many things outside my door, so they don't come and knock on it. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, and they'd be terrified if they saw <laughs> Nigel. But listen, um, Jenny, <laughs> is Halloween a vulgar Americanism? Well, first of all, it's not an Americanism at all. Really? So that's the first thing. I know when it rains outside, we can blame the <laughs> Americans. Today's Tuesday, it's the Americans' fault. But it isn't. It was originally a religious holiday and then also a pagan holiday. Mm. It, you know, Americans... The Americans made a big deal of it, didn't yeah, they? But the we, Americans we kind of imported it. Yeah, but the Americans make a big deal out of everything, God bless them. <laughs> they feel show up or stay home. So if they're yeah. going to do something, then they're going to do it big. That's not their fault. OK, briefly... Uh, yes, David. I've got a little message for you for Halloween. Sure. It is the night of ghosties and ghoulies. So watch out for ghosties and keep your hand on your handbag. <laughs> Nicely done. Ah. Just after the watershed as well. <laughs> uh, but coming up in my Take a 10, I'll be exposing the scandal of car crime, which has become a national emergency. We are on the highway to hell. But first, my Mark Meets guest is a world-renowned expert on plastic surgery. Is a facelift now like going to the hairdressers? I'll be asking my brilliant guest. Plus, what does she think I should have done? And in an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight people's poll, we've been asking, does Keir Starmer's handling of the Israel crisis demonstrate he'll struggle as Prime Minister? The results are in. I shall reveal all next. Who is it? We're here for the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Pretty mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London-Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. On a Mark Dolan tonight, People's Poll, we've been asking, does Keir Starmer's handling of the Israel crisis demonstrate he'll struggle as Prime Minister? The results are in. 86.5% say yes and 13.5% say no. It's time now for Mark Meets, and this evening, one of the most renowned experts in so-called facial aesthetics, plastic surgery guru and the pioneer of the liquid facelift, no less, Sheridan France, who has won an army of fans with her appearances on ITV's Make Me Perfect, Discovery Channel's Plastic Surgery School and Channel 5's Extreme Makeover. With the popularity of plastic surgery exploding, is having a nip and tuck or a few injections in the face now the same as going to the hairdresser? Let's ask Sheridan France right now. She joins me in the studio. Hi, Sheridan. Good evening. Hello. Um, is a cosmetic procedure like a haircut now? Mm, possibly. Yes, absolutely. It's becoming that way. It shouldn't be. And mm. hopefully the new regulations will, will tighten everything up. But it's slightly out of control at the moment. Well, well, indeed. And I know that you're very concerned about that. It needs to be regulated. And you're absolutely right. I made a documentary about people who have extreme plastic surgery mm. for Channel 4. And some of those surgeons really should be struck off, if I'm quite yeah. honest with you. Um, but let's talk about ageing. What happens to the face as we get older? Well, we lose elasticity, we lose collagen, we lose basically we lose structure in the face, right. and um, you. Be, but the face changes shape. So when we're younger, it's sort of like this. The most simple way to put it is like this. Mm. Then it becomes like this, and sometimes it becomes like that. So it basically drops and becomes more square. And we we do we, in in my clinic we do quite a lot of work where we actually try to in a very natural way bring the face back up into this shape the oval shape the ideal youthful appearance and is that the liquid facelift it is all right so what um because i would have thought a liquid facelift is a few pints of stella and then i look <laughs> so what what, uh, what is involved because you've pioneered this technology well i haven't pioneered lots of people are doing it yeah, but, but you're we, like we do it on for doing it aren't you yes because I've, I've got you've got me booked in for monday haven't you so. <laughs> we we do a lot of, we do a lot of it we do a lot of it because um it's very popular there are lots of reasons why people um uh, you know, it, you avoid going under the knife, you can get fantastic results, you can get really natural results just by um, putting dermal filler into certain areas of the face. And So is that what the liquid face lift yeah, is? So yes. it's injections into key parts of the face which yes. then somehow naturally bring it back up to yes. that shape? Yes, how that's long, right. How, how, how long does the procedure take? Um, I like to do it... I mean, some people do it... Uh, very, you know, in one session. But I prefer to work over a, a couple of 
treatment time. Mm. So they'd come in and then they would have a treatment, say, we'd assess it two weeks later and then we'll just go from there. So it could take two, two weeks to a month, but the actual right. injecting time takes probably about an hour, an hour and a half All right, each so that's, treatment. That's two Mondays in a row for you. <laughs> uh, uh, Harry, have we got some footage of, of some of some of some of these uh, the amazing miraculous work that you've done so take me through this you've worked with this lady is that that must be after she's very yes beautiful. yes that's she looks after. great that's, that's her fault. oh god she was yeah, awful before um, what a hag she oh that's a big improvement Blimey. Porter, she actually was taking a medication actually that right. um made her face atrophy she lost a lot of tissue in the face she's young yeah but she lost a lot of tissue because she lost a, dropped a lot of weight purely as a a result of taking this medication. It was a right. prescribed. It was a, a prescribed. Med yeah, it was a prescribed medication. It wasn't a, a, a slimming medication, and consequently, she lost a lot. And she felt quite self-conscious about that. And we did some treatment. We treated her cheekbones, and we treated the cheek hollows, and we did some lips. And she's really. I mean, she looks so different. So yeah, Harry. Lovely. Let's see. That's before, and then uh, let's go back to the after if we can. That's before. And we'll just uh, we'll load up. Of course. Uh, so there we are. That's before, and this lady, and then. Um, yeah. Afterwards, it is a transformation. Of course, I'm only kidding. She was a very beautiful lady at the start. <laughs> but you've definitely boosted her features, and congratulations to her on a successful uh, procedure. How long does it last? Probably six to nine months, maybe a year. Not depends um, on somebody's metabolism, if they go to the gym a lot, or, you know, if they're... And, and what are we looking at cost-wise? I mean, is it, is it hundreds or is it... A thousand? A thousand, 50, about a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds. All right, fifteen hundred, a mm. thousand, but cheaper than a, an actual facelift yeah. and less medical risk, of course. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well, look, um, there are some other people who are celebrities who have had work done. I'd like mm. your professional appraisal <laughs> of good, bad or indifferent. OK, okay not so putting me on the spot or anything. No, no, no. You, you only have to tell me what you think. <laughs> Little Lord Sugar. Uh, oh, mother, right. He had bags under his eyes. Right. And I think he had those treated. Yeah, lower blepharoplasty uh, by the looks of it. A lower blepharoplasty. Right. And what's your verdict on, on uh, Lord Sugar? Are you happy with the work they did there? I think it's fine. If that's what his problem was, if he was concerned, I mean, he may, it's happy if people, you know, some people are just concerned about one area and that's all, if he's just worried about that, that's done, a, he's had a good job. Yeah, he only got those bags because he was the owner of Tottenham for a few years. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, Kylie Jenner is next. Oh, gosh. Well, we've all seen the before photographs, so we know what she's had done. A um, lot of filler? Uh, surgery, I think. Oh, apparently this is before, right? OK, I'm very nice. <laughs> ah, that's after. Oh, gosh, it looks like a different person. Yeah, I think she's had quite a bit done, hasn't she? Would you call that work satisfactory, or do you think she's been a little uh, trigger-happy? Oh, that's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I love natural. I yeah. really love natural work. I love, you know, where you're... You know, you have work done, but it look, doesn't look like you've had anything done. It just improves and enhances your I, own beauty. I know what you mean. They don't look like you've had plastic surgery. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Sharon Osborne, um, who I'm a big fan of, and she's a good friend of mine, actually. We've uh, Lovely. been on the show a few times. Lovely. So this is the before. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, sorry. Because so you, you like that, uh, I like the before. OK. And then last but not least, uh, Jocelyn Wildenstein. This is before. We're just going to load it up. Don't worry. We're just going to put 10p in the meter. And uh, there you oh, go. Oh, gosh, that's terrible, isn't it? That's real body dysmorphia. She's not been to see you. That's, that's not the old liquid facelift, is no, it? No, no. That's something. That's a liquid lunch. Well, that's a psychological problem, isn't it? <laughs> Bless her. Uh, listen, she's in her 80s now. She's still going strong. At least we're talking about her. Uh, listen, briefly, how can people find out about what you do? Oh, we, you can look me on my website. Sheridan France Facial Aesthetics. Yes. Brilliant stuff. I tell you what, really. Oh, what do I need done before you go? Oh, a complete liquid facelift. <laughs> <laughs> Can you take years off me? Yeah, ten. All right, all right, ten years. Good. Obviously, I, you've not offered to sort out the hair, but you know, you're not you're not working miracles. Uh, my thanks to Sheridan France. Really lovely to have you in the studio. Thank you. Thank being you very a much. Great sport as well. Thank you. Okay, look, lots more to come in the ten o'clock hour. Tomorrow's papers hot off the press, and in my take at ten, the scandal of car crime. You won't believe the statistics I've got. That's next. We're here for the show. For energy this time. Well
Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon, on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the smart speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Tired of the usual focused, tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It is 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online. In the United Kingdom and across the world, this is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, I'll be exposing the scandal of car crime, which has become a national emergency. You will not believe the statistics I've got for you. We're on the highway to hell. In a world exclusive, as the late Queen Elizabeth's childhood friend slams Meghan Markle and expresses sympathy for Harry, I'll get reaction from the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from my top pundits. So, a packed show, lots to get through. My Take a Ten is coming, it's car crime and it is a scandal. But first, the news and Aaron Armstrong. Very good evening to you. It's 10 o'clock. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Israel's Prime Minister says the second stage of its war with Hamas has begun and he's warned of a long and difficult campaign ahead. Benjamin Netanyahu confirmed Israeli ground operations have expanded in northern Gaza. He referred to that as the stronghold of evil. The enclave has been pounded with artillery fire and airstrikes since last night. Israel has launched its heaviest bombardment since the beginning of the conflict. Civilians who've been told to move south for their own safety remain cut off as all communications are down, uh, so no new casualty figures have been released. Uh, Mr Netanyahu says Israel's supreme goal is the complete elimination of Hamas. Well, waves of rockets uh, continue to be fired from Gaza towards uh, targets in southern Israel, with sirens sounding in its biggest city, Tel Aviv. These pictures show a series of missiles being intercepted uh, by Israel's air defences. Some landed, though, including in Tel Aviv and in the city of Ashkelon. Uh, no casualties have been reported. 
Meanwhile, a group of Israeli activists have held an anti-war demonstration in Tel Aviv. The protesters blocked a road near the Ministry of Defence, holding up banners claiming war has no winners. They're also calling for a ceasefire and the return of hostages in what's thought to be the first anti-war demonstration in Israel. Earlier, Benjamin Netanyahu addressed reports that Hamas had offered to swap its hostages in exchange for the release of all Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. The Prime Minister, though, says it's been considered but would be counterproductive to their objectives. In the UK, at least 100,000 people took to the streets of London earlier, demanding an end to Israel's attacks in Gaza. A total of nine people were arrested. Uh, two were held for assaults on police officers near Downing Street. Seven more were detained for public order offences, uh, several of those for hate crimes. The Met has warned that officers will intervene if protesters are deemed to be supporting terrorism, and that includes the chanting of uh, particular slogans. It's the third weekend of demonstrations in London. Uh, there were also rallies held in other cities around the country. And former leadership candidate for the SNP, Ash Regan, has defected to its rival, the ALBA party. She's become ALBA's first MSP and says her old party's lost its focus on independence. ALBA rivals the SNP as a pro-independence party and was set up by former First Minister Alex Salmond. Uh, Humza Youssef, the leader of the SNP, has played down the defection, saying it's no great loss and that he's not surprised. That is it from me. I'll have more a little later this evening, but for the moment, it is back to Mark. No great loss. What a rude and ignorant thing to say from the Scottish First Minister. Tells you everything you need to know about his character. I like to hang on to everyone in my team. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In a world exclusive, as the late Queen Elizabeth's childhood friend slams Meghan Markle and expresses sympathy for Harry, I'll get reaction from the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. This evening, author Jenny Trent Hughes, political commentator Claire Pearsall and legendary radio and TV presenter David Hamilton. Plus, they'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros of the day. A packed hour to come and those papers are on the way. But first, my take at 10. We can't have nice things anymore, can we? You can't walk down the street holding your phone in front of you for fear it will be snatched out of your hand by a gang of thugs. The police response? Keep your phone in your pocket. Is that what a free and safe society looks like? With law enforcement urging you to yield to the will of criminals and accommodate their criminality into your daily life, what the hell is going on? With a 6% conviction rate for burglary, that crime has effectively been decriminalised. The only reason to call the police, should it happen, is to get a reference number for the insurers. People are now being pursued down the street or followed home if they're wearing a posh watch like a Rolex. And shoplifting appears to have become a national pastime, replacing crickets and tiddlywinks. And then there's car crime. Exclusive data acquired by the Liberal Democrats, of all people, suggests that police forces in England and Wales are investigating fewer than one in four car thefts. At the same time, the RS RAC reveal that just 6.7% of the almost 400,000 reported car crimes in this country annually resulted in anyone being charged. That's right, 400,000 car crimes, 6.7% prosecuted. God forbid you should leave a bag in your car overnight or a pair of nice sunglasses. The next day, you'll likely be greeted with a smashed window or a missing item. Some time ago, a friend of mine had his car smashed open so they could take, wait for it, a picnic blanket. I had no idea criminals were so keen on alfresco dining in their local park. The criminals make a judgment, as do cops, and that is that this is a victimless crime because owners can claim on insurance. Except such is the level of neglect on the part of our police forces to tackle vehicle crime, that extra cost is being passed on to you and to me. Now, take a look at this. I've been driving this beauty for years now. A Toyota Prius in astral black. Good runner, air conditioning, cruise control as standard, cloth upholstery, nasty stain on the passenger seat, which won't come out, living the dream. 
yours for a grand. Let's talk. So, no points on my licence, no claims, and yet inexplicably, as for so many people, my premiums go up every year, sometimes by a couple of hundred pounds. Why? Well, because whilst I've been a good boy, and you've probably been a good boy or good girl yourselves, we're all paying for the victims of crime. Luckily, my beaten up old vehicle will probably never hugely break the bank to insure. But the problem is getting so bad in our great cities that some more premium models are becoming uninsurable, like the excellent British built Range Rover cars. People work hard and save hard to acquire these beautiful vehicles, but are now struggling to find cover for them in urban areas. The Telegraph did a little experiment themselves, creating a fictional 35-year-old woman living in London with six years driving experience and no claims. Let's call her Lottie. Lottie's insurance quote for the latest Range Rover Vela R Dynamic was £22,500 for a year. Good luck with that. Looks like Lottie will be taking the bus. We've become acclimatised to criminality now, expecting to get mugged or even assaulted at night, expecting to get burgled, expecting our car to get broken into or nicked. This is a failure of policing, a failure of police culture and a failure of government policy. Look, I think our police officers are the best in the world. I love them and they do what they can, but they've got precious few resources and their job is becoming impossible. But you can't enjoy life and you can't feel safe if you fear you are always on the verge of being a victim of crime. I worry that there will come a time when crime is so bad that we may never get the genie back into the bottle again. The credibility of the police, just like your vehicle, is gone in 60 seconds. The crime is fast and we're all furious. The way the police effectively turn a blind eye to car theft is enough to drive you round the bend. Have you suffered from a car crime? Let me know. Mark at gbnews.com. I'll get to your emails shortly. But reacting to my Take at 10, my top pundits tonight. A brand new star on the show tonight, author and broadcaster Jenny Trent Hughes, political commentator and former Conservative advisor, the brilliant Claire Pearsall, and legendary radio and TV presenter David Hamilton. Uh, let me ask you, David, your reaction to these statistics about car crime. Only one in four is investigated, 6% leading to a prosecution. It's incredible, isn't it? I must tell you, Mark, I have a friend who lives in Chelsea and he has a Range Rover and his insurance has rocketed to £5,000 a year, even though he has a garage and off-street parking. And the reason is, in his area, 20 cars are stolen. I think it's, yes, not a week, every day. It's astonishing. I mean, that's about £400 a month. Uh, Jenny, you don't have these problems. You live on a barge, don't you? You're completely wrong. No, yes, I do live on a barge. But I ha used to have a 92 Volkswagen. And I lived in a little village called Corsham in Wiltshire. Very nice, very leafy, very lovely. Parked my car on the street. Fantastic. I moved to where I'm at now. I'm in a marina. There is nothing anywhere. The car is parked in a locked area and there's nothing. You have to drive 10 minutes to be near anything and it's very small what you're near. My insurance is five times more now mm. than it was when I was parking it on the street in a village. So I think that there's, yet, there's, there's crime, but we need to have a conversation with some of these insurance companies. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I find the insurance market completely inexplicable, Claire. Uh, I had to get an insurance quote for a motorbike a couple of years ago, and fully comp was cheaper than third party only. Make it make sense. I really wish I could. Uh, a few years ago, um, we moved from one side of the road to the other side of the road, same postal area, and it went up by £150.
for my car for mm. moving from one side of the road to the other. Uh, nothing had changed, no points, no claims, no nothing. <laughs> and in fact, I was, uh, you know, a year older when this happened. So it doesn't make sense. I think the insurance companies really need to explain themselves. And if we're paying for other people's bad behaviour, I don't see why we then have to pay admin fees to change address, why we should have to pay up for other people's bad behaviour on the roads. It well, just beggars yeah. belief. Claire, far be it from me to defend the insurance industry, but I think the reason why the premiums are going up is because so many bloody cars are being stolen now. And I think, Claire, it just tells us something that's very depressing, which is we can't have nice things anymore. But we also expect an awful lot from our police. They are expected to go after proper criminals uh, for rape and sexual assault. We want them to uh, investigate burglaries, car crimes. And what they're actually doing is being held up dealing with crimes from the internet, people's hurt feelings, and that needs to stop. So I think that we need to treat our mm. police a lot better. We need to let them loose on the crimes that actually need solving mm. and step away from somebody being a little bit offended. And I think that would start a lot to help. Also, put more police out on the streets. I think if you see a visible presence, it does make a difference. Very difficult, by the way, to uh, track these cars down because in many cases they are out of the country within about tw uh, 24 hours. And and also, in many cases, they're broken up. So they break up yeah, and they take yeah. the parts and flog off the parts. So very, very difficult uh, crime for the police to solve. David, I was moved by Jenny's story. How much does your Bentley cost to insure? <laughs> Your Bentley, how much? Oh, my Bentley. I don't have a Bentley anymore, but I do have a Range Rover, which I'm living in the country, so uh, my insurance is not quite as bad as my friend's, but it did absolutely rock it up, and uh, I think, you know, people with cars like that are, are penalised very badly. Uh, well, listen, the car crime emails are coming in. Have you been a victim? Mark at gbnews.com. My pundits are back at 10.30 with the papers, but coming up in a world exclusive, as the late Queen Elizabeth's childhood friend slams Meghan Markle and expresses sympathy for Harry, I'll get reaction from the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Same Kinsey thing. Schofield. Plus, we've been asking with irritation around Halloween growing, should Britain put two fingers up to American holidays? Well, the results are in. I shall reveal all next. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. The show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan Tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever, and that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> well, it's on your teeth. It's on your I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
We're here for the show. More energy this time! Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Uh, Sarah's not happy about the cost of car insurance. Hi, Mark. Car theft will be pushing insurance costs up, but so will the damage caused by electric cars. If they hit something, the damage is ten times worse. Uh, Ian says, Mark, I rang for the cheapest quote for my car today with no changes except one extra year of no claims bonus. And it's risen from £491 to 1,332, that's more than double. Uh, Ian, I'm really shocked to hear that. What an absolute scandal. Uh, keep those emails coming, mark at gbnews.com. A lot of you very angry about car theft and indeed the cost of insuring your motor. But it's time now for the results of our second and final Mark Dolan tonight people's poll with irritation around Halloween growing. Should Britain put two fingers up to American holidays? Are they... A vulgar Americanism. Well, 75.1% say yes, 24.9% say no. So, big fat raspberry for Halloween. It's time now for US News with the queen of American showbiz, royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield, who is anything but an American vulgarism. Hi, Kinsey. I know, I'm sitting here thinking, like, oh, we hate Halloween, we hate Americans. Here comes Kinsey with, with, her, uh, with her Halloween bow tie ready to go. <laughs> oh, she's ready to go. Listen, you make up for everything, let me tell you, Kinsey. Our viewers and our listeners love having you on a Saturday night. And let's talk about a former close friend of the late, great Queen Elizabeth, who's been speaking out in regards to the Sussexes, what she said. Yes, yeah, so this is her childhood friend, Lady Glen Connor. Um, you know, she actually was one of her ladies that was with her on her coronation day. So sincerely very close to Queen Elizabeth. Um, mm. She's recently released a book and she was talking to Giles Brandwith on his Rosebud podcast. And somehow it always happens. You don't mean it to, but somehow they ended up on the subject of Harry and Meghan. <laughs> and she felt... She says she felt like Meghan didn't have a realistic idea of what was expected her of her as a duchess. Perhaps she felt like this was another acting role. Mm. Um, and she said that she felt really sad for Prince Harry. Where there was, where the real gossip came, Mark, is she talks about how she introduced herself to John Kerry, uh, who's a diplomat and a politician here in the United States at King Charles's coronation. And I'm going to read this word for word because uh, I'm going to be a little bit naughty here, Mark. So John Kerry, when she poked him and asked him what the Americans feel about Harry and Meghan, he says word for word, we all feel very, very sorry for Harry. I think I can just leave it at that. So I need to translate. This is American speak for you, Mark. I want to translate this for you. <laughs> we all feel very, very sorry for Harry. I think I can just leave it at that. Is Harry is not the problem. Am I wrong? Like, it sounds like he's saying that the problem, he sympathizes with Harry, Americans sympathize with Harry because they don't feel like he is ultimately the problem. And that's kind of what Lady Glenn Connor said. Um, now, I want to stress, um, John Kerry's people came out and said he didn't remember having this conversation. So kind of denying that it ever took place. But does a 91-year-old lady have any reason to lie to Giles Correct. Brandwood? I really don't think so. I'm going to go ahead. I'm just putting it out there that I think this is probably the truth. Well, I love your American translation. You always get the true words when it's the American translation. And, of course, these comments bring us tantalizingly close to understanding what the Queen might have thought when she was around. 
Agree. I, you know, and, and that's why I do think that the queen had suggested to Meghan Markle, continue acting, continue doing what you want to do and what you've become so great at. Um, because I, I don't think that the queen wanted to take anything away from her. And I think she wanted to allow Meghan to stay in her comfort zone. Um, but it was Harry and Meghan that insisted that they were going to become full-time working royals while having secret meetings with Quibi on the side and, and talking to Oprah Winfrey six months after the wedding before uh, Meg's it or anything. I, I really believe that they ultimately intended to, I, I think that they were planning on leaving the royal family long before we actually heard about it. Doesn't surprise me. Isn't it wonderful watching that footage of the late great Queen Elizabeth? It just fills my heart with joy to see her again. Uh, she was a great stateswoman, of course, but very frugal as well. Not the only member of the family to count the pennies, Kinsey. Do you remember, this was a scandal. Um, a, a reporter had gotten a job at the palace and it was supposed to be like some big inside scoop of how you know the royals really lived. And we found out she ate breakfast in like Tupperware. And it was like, oh, she's just like, you know, grandma's just like us. But you're absolutely right. She walked around and turned the lights off in rooms that people weren't using. She would squeeze lemon on her salmon and send the lemon squeeze back to the kitchen for additional use. I mean, that's how frugal she was. She would not heat up the entire palace. She'd heat up individual rooms. Uh, she was very conscious about that. And, you know, it's. I think it just makes her even more um, lovable because it reminds you of individuals in your household that are saying, turn the lights yeah. out, or I know that this shirt has a hole in it, like King Charles. King Charles wears things until they practically disintegrate yeah. off of his body. He wore a vintage suit to Harry and Meghan's wedding. Um, but I, I, I love I love hearing it because it reminds you of someone you know and love. Most definitely. And of course, Charles wants to cut his cloth in regards to the royal budget these days, negotiating with Prince Andrew. I think Andrew's lost a quarter of a million pounds a year already from the royal coffers. And uh, Charles wants that monarchy to be a lean, mean fighting machine, doesn't he? Absolutely. And you're seeing um, that you're seeing Prince William follow in his footsteps there, too. Uh, you know, there's an article in the Daily Mail talking about how the kids furniture is Ikea. I would have never wow. guessed in a royal estate you would find Ikea furniture. But there you have it. Um, <laughs> and so I, I do think it's just a, it's a theme. It's a theme that's like been wonderfully inherited throughout generations. Now, Britney Spears certainly has been, probably still is, one of the biggest stars in the world, a prodigiously talented singer. Uh, she was a child star, then she had a pop career, she's made millions, and she's released her autobiography, and it's really got the world talking. Well, first of all, Mark, have you read it? Because if you have read it, no. you and I need to have a conversation on the side. We have got, you've got to read it. We've got to gossip. I cannot wait to talk to you about this. But yes, and a lot of the biggest scandals involve her ex-boyfriend, Justin Timberlake, huge solo artist, but at the time was in the band NSYNC. Um, it's a, you know, she says that she had, they got pregnant. She had an abortion because he wasn't ready to be a father. She talks about their breakup and how she felt like he really um, kind of manipulated the situation to where the press were hounding her and he was this golden boy. And it has had some real repercussions for Justin Timberlake it, today. I mean, this, these are things that happened 25 you know, or no, 20 years ago. Mm. And um, he's had to shut up his Instagram comments because people are harassing him online. Now they're harassing his wife, who is an actress named Jessica Biel. I think that's really unfair. Mark, mm. this is an unpopular opinion, but I think it's time that we forgive Justin Timberlake Timberlake and leave him alone. This stuff happened a long time ago. You know, if I, if, if somebody judged me for things that happened with my ex-boyfriends, Mark, I could be in jail right now. Thank God they don't. Well, indeed. Now, Madonna is still touring in her 60s. The Rolling Stones are number one at the age of 80 in the album charts. Uh, do you think there's a way back for Britney Spears in, into uh, the world of music? Hey, I think she's incredibly talented. I think her music is so much fun. 
but she she what that her career and her talent was weaponized against mm. her she talks about how her father made her eat chicken and canned vegetables for two years straight while her family was uh, up in Destin Florida on vacation eating you know lobster and shrimp and all this delicious food on her dime in her condo in Florida I think she's got a lot of healing to do and until she finds that passion again for performing and until she wants to go there versus you know having flashbacks of somebody cracking the whip and making her do it i think she's i don't think she's gonna go there and god bless her figure it out because we love you and we miss your music if you want to join my reading club with Kinsey schofield it's the britney autobiography mark at gbnews.com we'll have regular meetings with wine and biscuits. Uh, Kinsey, we'll catch you in a week's time. Uh, the queen of US showbiz, royal and political reporting. Check out her excellent website, To Die For Daily, which is full of royal exclusives and her podcast of the same name. Coming out tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from my pundits. The papers are coming, see you in two. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's The Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Put your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Uh, I will get to your emails very shortly, mark at gbnews.com. Let me tell you a bit of housekeeping about the show. Tomorrow night, it's the Dinosaur Hour. John Cleese from 9 till 10. I will be here at 10. My take at 10, Anne Whittacombe and the papers and a special studio guest as well. So for the next 10 weeks, Mark Dolan tonight. Less is more, 10 till 11. Don't miss it. And I'm already planning the take at 10. And it will spark a few fireworks, let me tell you. Halloween, eat your heart out. OK, time for this.
Tomorrow's front pages are in the Mail on Sunday. London Jihad demo leader is an NHS doctor. Extremists double life as a suburban GP exposed by the Mail on Sunday as Hamas paraglider attack mastermind is killed in Gaza strikes. Sunday Telegraph, Israel sends in elite troops for a long war. Ministers plan extremism crackdown as fears grow over UK permitting anti-Jewish hate. And BBC shake up to tackle complaints of bias. The Observer, Sunak King's speech to open green divide with Labour. Rishi Sunak's government will use next week's King's speech to advance, adva excuse me, advance expansion of North Sea oil and gas exploration, as well as pro-car policies in the hope of opening up a clear divide over the green agenda with Labour. Netanyahu declares a second war of independence as fears for Gazans grow. Sunday Express now ban jihadi hate mob. Call to act as protesters shout Alu Akbar and praise Hamas heroism. And Brittany wanted us to have a baby girl. Uh, that is an exclusive in relation to the young singer we were discussing with Kinsey Schofield. Sunday Mirror now. Pestminster exclusive. Tory minister and the sex bully MP. A top Tory has shockingly backed bullying and sex abuse claims MP Peter Bone. Minister for Disabled People Tom Persglove went door knocking with his suspended pal who denies wrongdoing ahead of a local election as the PM was blasted for losing control of his party. Let me reiterate that Peter Bone denies the allegations placed on his door. Uh, Daily Star Sunday now, Supernatural exclusive. This is your captain spooking. Psychic Sally seance at 39,000 feet. World-renowned psychic Sally Morgan, who has ghosts on speed dial, has told how she used her supernatural powers to summon spirits on a plane after a shock request at 39,000 feet. She's been on my show before. She's a star. Listen, my guests always make headlines, as do my pundits tonight. Brand new to the show, and I think you'll agree, smashing it. Author and broadcaster Jenny Trent Hughes. Commentator and former Conservative advisor Claire Pearsall. And legendary radio and television broadcaster David Hamilton. OK, folks, lots of uh, stories to get through. And a rather sobering headline, David in the Sunday Telegraph, Israel sends in elite troops for what will be a long war. Yes, awful, isn't it? It does look like being a long war, isn't it? Yeah. And um, it's very much sort of knocked Ukraine out of the... Everybody's forgotten, not completely forgotten, but overlooked Ukraine now, and we're all concerned about this. I mean, um, another... How many wars are there going to be around the world before yeah. there's a world war? You know, this, this yeah. could spill out all over the place. Lebanon, Syria, you know, other countries could yeah. be involved as well. Right. You know, Russia, China and beyond. Well, who knows what uh, well, Putin's... The, the new axis of, of evil, potentially. I mean, Jenny, do my viewers and listeners have skin in the game? Why does this story, what's happening in the Middle East, matter to us, do you think? When I was in my 20s, which was a very long time ago... Ten years ago. ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the big... My big fear, and then by that point in time, I was living in New York, and the big fear was that the world was going to explode and World War III and that it was all going to come out of the, out of the Middle East and that the situation needed to be solved and it needed to be addressed or the world was just going to be blown up. I was listening to Sir Peter Hain the other day and he was talking about the comparison between this and Northern Ireland, which I had skin in that game because I was married to somebody uh, from Belfast. And the fact of the matter is that diplomacy should never have stopped. And what we tend to do with the Middle East is when nobody's fighting, nothing is going on, then we go on about our merry business. And then when they crank it up, then all of a sudden everybody's standing up and they have something to say and they have an opinion. And now I think we have finally reached what I've been waiting for for all these decades, where it, the, the poop is really about to hit the fan. Well, I think it is. I think I've answered my own question, and Jenny has as well. We do have skin in the game. Israel's war, to a degree, is our war, Claire. It is, and I think what David said, it's really worrying where it spills out and what happens mm. next, because you can see the other regions getting involved. But what's more important is what is going to happen with Israel and with Palestinian citizens, not 
Hamas, who are a terrorist group, but the innocent civilians. Where is it going to end and what kind of conclusion are we going to get out of this? Because at the moment, you can't see how this ends other than badly. What, what's your verdict really of, of those people calling, including Labour backbenchers, calling for a ceasefire? I think that you can't call for a ceasefire. That just rewards a terrorist group. Why shouldn't Israel defend themselves? What I do think we need are the humanitarian pauses to get aid into there and get actually some of those vulnerable people out. You've got people, elderly people, very sick people, babies in hospitals. They can't move. Even if Netanyahu's given them a window of mm. movement, they can't physically do so. So I think we need to be able to get those people out, get some supplies in, medicine, water, the basics. But Hamas want continue. to stop that happening, of course, of and course this is the do. problem. It's not in their interest to let it happen at all. No, indeed not. Um, an interesting story in regards to uh, the next election and what the hot topics might be. Uh, Jenny, let me put this one to you. Sunak's King's speech to open green divide with Labour. Now, we know that... Uh, that uh, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has slowed down the race to net zero, uh, a moratorium of five years for new petrol and diesel cars, gas boilers, and the granting of oil and gas licences in the North Sea. Um, a big difference between Labour's position. Will it help Sunak or hinder him? It depends on who you think really is control, in control. Because I actually don't think that politicians really are in control. I think that business and corporations mm. and private interests are who's really in control. And the fact of the matter is that on one hand, you have the youth. Yeah. You know, you have my son, Claire's son, your children, and they're all about save the polar bears, save the world. Yeah. But then you have business, and they're not focused on save the polar bears. They're, except for giving it lip service, they're interested on their bottom line. And when it comes down to it, nowadays, that's who wins. Mm. Well, indeed. Well, of course, my viewers and listeners have a bottom line, don't they? That's their energy bills, that's the cost of running a car or buying exactly. a new one. So do you think that Sunak's overtures might, might actually be an advantage for him uh, in the face of Keir Starmer, who's talked about borrowing more money to invest in green renewables. Oh, I absolutely think that it's it, that it is to his advantage, and it will do him well. Do I agree with what he's saying? Not particularly. Well, what do you think about this dividing line now between Labour and the Tories on net zero? Is it a smart move from Sunak or a desperate last attempt? <sighs> It, it feels a little bit more like a desperate last attempt, even though I agree with dropping some of the green measures. It hasn't made a difference in the polls. And that, I thought that was quite interesting when you saw all the announcements at conference and just before that to the polls coming out now. They haven't shifted. It doesn't seem to have boosted uh, the government's chances of getting in next time. So I'm not sure that this is going to move it either, even though I fundamentally agree with some of what he's doing. Well, I don't know whether, David, this policy, this sort of diluting of net zero on the part of Rishi Sunak has quite landed yet, but they've got a year to sell that message. Mm. Uh, my viewers and listeners are struggling, and I think they'll appreciate a message from Number 10, which is that we're on your side. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, things need to be more crystal clear, don't they? Um, they your confusion is the one thing that, that we, we don't need. Mm. Um, and uh, we need clear policies, I think. Right, and, and I guess by pushing back on some of the extreme elements of net zero, that's reassurance for people who are thinking, what's going to happen Yep. to the cost of an energy bill, yep. all the rest of it. Um, listen, uh, another developing story, this courtesy of the Sun newspaper, and uh, it's, it's a bit of a shocker, if I'm honest with you. Sue Gray's son is running to become the Labour MP for a plum seat at the next election. Labour activist Liam Conlon is battling to be the candidate for Beckenham and Penge in South London. This comes just months after the Sun on Sunday revealed claims that he'd been boasting that he was being groomed for a safe Labour seat. Now, this is awkward, Claire, and you can tell us why. Sue Gray, of course, supposedly neutral civil servant. Indeed. A few months later... Indeed. Uh, this is Sue Gray, who uh, headed up the civil service and then decided to go and be chief of staff to Sir Keir Starmer. Um, it's no surprise that her son was going to follow in those footsteps. He was already photographed being an activist. I think putting him into a plum seat is ridiculous. I'm sure there were probably lots of local Labour candidates who would be very good. And it just feels a little bit like nepotism gone mad on behalf of the Labour Party. Well, indeed, and it's a worse look for Keir Starmer, who yeah. I understand had meetings, certainly allegedly had meetings with Sue Gray whilst she was still a senior civil servant, which might have uh, rather uh, gone against her 
code of conduct. Exactly, and I said at the time I would wonder what uh, Sue Gray would have to say about Sue Gray, <laughs> because she was always a real stickler for the rules, uh, and I was employed under her remit um, back in 2018 at the Home Office, and she was frightening. So I think really? that she would have viewed her own behaviour as pretty appalling if that was true, if those meetings did take place and those meetings happened uh, without being recorded properly. I think she would have come down on herself like a tonne of bricks. Like a tonne of bricks. Mm. Uh, let's have a look at some of these other stories. Um, ban jihadi hate mob. Call to act as protesters shout Alu, Allahu Akbar and praise Hamas heroism. Uh, it's very critical, isn't it, Jenny, that we have free speech in this country, freedom to protest as well. Have some of these individuals gone too far? I think so, but then I, I don't understand because because I actually, people get angry, but it is actually an emotion that I don't particularly understand. So I've demonstrated twice in my life, both against the same thing. Poll, poll tax, <laughs> Iraq war? Or you won't say? The big B. Oh, yeah. the Brexit. <laughs> right. Yeah. How did that go in the end? Uh, well, thank you. I thank you. How, how did that work out for me? <laughs> I'm, I'm now looking for someone in France to marry me so that I can go live in France. So any, anybody out there, any volunteers? Listen, I've got an Irish passport. Let's talk. Oh, <laughs> been there, done that. Um, uh, you know, so I actually, I understand that people need to feel that they're doing something. Mm. That, that makes you feel better if you're taking an action. Standing in the street and hollering about something something, I actually don't get it. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. in the society that we live in, where we're all cheek by jowl with each other, that you can't have people shouting against the Jews and people shouting against the Palestinians. I don't think that that accomplishes anything. Mm. Uh, too right. Uh, look, lots more from my brilliant pundits tonight. Uh, more front pages coming in thick and fast. Plus, they'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros. And we're going to do something quite special because Jilly Cooper, the sex author, has complained about the disappearance of the macho man. So we're going to have a look at a handful of male celebrities, and my pundits are going to rate them out of 10 in the macho-ometer. That's next. See you in two. Who is it? We're here for the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. 
tired of the usual focus tested pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. But then I OK, well, listen, quite a big mm. debate about what Rishi Sunak needs to do to win the next election. Uh, quite significant differences now on net zero policy between the Tories and Labour. Uh, Lee says, Mark, I believe the silent majority, like myself, generally don't bother with polls. We rarely take part in them. But Rishi Sunak's position on trans and rowing back on the green agenda is a positive vote winner for him. Carol says, Mark, stop the boats. That will win Rishi Sunak the next election. And Carol's given me two kisses, so mwah, mwah. Straight back at you, Carol. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. You're a very affectionate audience, let me tell you. I've got a different Lee who's emailed in a short poem, and I like it. Lee has written the following. There is no achievement in submissive appeasement. A coup is never, ever right. It sows doubt and weakens might. The PM is guilty of being the two. He's just a weak politician who is just marking time until it's over. Bet he doesn't look over his shoulder. Off to Sonia climbs, counting dimes to leave Britain to its fate and Labour will open the gates. Les, what a job. That's not only, deep. Not only, sorry. <laughs> no, it says Lee. I'm confused. Oh, it's Les! Les! The other one was Lee, so it's Les. Well done. Um, I don't want to give your surname because maybe I'll out you, shall I say? But anyway, Les, thank you for your lovely, wonderful uh, thingy. Um, and John <laughs> says, hi, Mark. What right have these protesters to carry on in our country? They live here. If these, if these people want to help the situation, they should start up a donation uh, for Palestine. I'm sick of these protesters in Britain. If they want to protest, do it against the cost of living in the UK where they live. OK, Sunday Times has arrived, courtesy of the team. Our second war of independence. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, vows to destroy Hamas and rescue hostages. NHS spent millions on failed AI doctor app backed by Matt Hancock. There's a surprise. What a winning streak he's on. <laughs> and Starmer's crisis over ceasefire intensifies, something I've debated at length with my brilliant pundits tonight. OK, well, look, let's get uh, on to our next story. The headline heroes and back page zeros of the day are coming. But macho men are a thing of the past with a backlash from toxic masculinity. Top sexy author Jilly Cooper says men are no longer allowed to be macho, yet we don't want stallions becoming whimpering drips. So, as the racy author bemoans the disappearance of tough guys, is this the end for Macho Man? Claire? No, it really shouldn't be. I'm feeling it, it, it will be, but there's something so great with Jilly Cooper's characters. I grew up with them, I loved them. And uh, Rupert Campbell Black is a hero in my world, and I think we need more <laughs> men like that. I, you know, I want them to be useful. Well, I have got a challenge for all of you now, because I'm going to show you eight male celebrities, and I would like you to rate them from zero to ten on the macho-ometer. Number 10 being most macho, number zero being the very least. But what about... But, but wait, we're talking... Ooh. Macho's one thing, but what about desirable? Right, well... Because listen, somebody could be very macho and you could be thinking... Well, in that case, we can go for desire. Shall we make that the metric? Okay. Desirable? Very difficult, no, gonna, very we, difficult been for me to say what's okay, metric. We, oh, no, no, it's okay. it's going to be macho. It's got to be not necessarily okay. attractive, but just pure masculine energy. Right. So let's have a look okay. at this. We start now with 007 himself. Daniel Craig, out of ten for macho. Oh. One. Eight. Eight. And why'd you give him one? Oh, I'll rephrase that, Jenny. <laughs> why won't you give him one? Because I've never understood the attraction with him. 
Yeah. I don't get it. All right. Well, look, he's dropped points there I think from he's Jenny, great but, but he got eight from Jenny. Uh, sorry, he got eight from Claire and eight from David. Next up, Anthony Joshua, the boxer, macho omita. Oh, that's a ten. He's a very, ten. very, very okay. macho. Very, and I yeah. think very he's butch. Uh, you um, see, mm, okay, ten. 10, yep. 10, and Jenny? On a macho scale, I give him a 3. Oh. But on an attractive oh. scale, I give him an 8. There you go. Uh -oh. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad he's yeah. finally... Uh, finally, somebody's won your affection. How about this guy, Dwayne The Rock Johnson? Um, what is his macho-ometer? 0 to 10. Mm. Jenny? Oh, Jenny, I think it's... It's the same thing, because yep. he's really a sweet man. Uh, so I guess he looks like, woman, come here. <laughs> you know, he's going to drag you back to the campfire. So I guess he's very macho. OK, number? No, we'll give him an eight. Eight? OK, just the numbers now, Claire? Seven. Seven, and David? Yeah, we'll go for an eight as well, I think. There you he go, we're very scoring high the rock. Me. OK, let's power through these now. Who's this guy? It's Arnold Schwarzenegger. His new book is out, which I'm enjoying. It's called uh, Be Useful. But is he useful in the macho department? Uh, out of ten, please, David. Uh, seven. Seven. Jenny? Four. Four. Claire? <laughs> Five. Oh, blimey. OK, how about this hunk? <laughs> Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. <laughs> Do we even bother with the votes? Does anyone want to give him one? I certainly don't. <laughs> All right. Is it zeros across Speak the board? zeros. All right. Well, look, I'm not allowed to vote, but I'm going to give him ten, cos I think he's <laughs> fabulous. But that's just me, isn't it? OK, how about this? Speaking of tens, let's go for... Former resident of number 10, GB News star, Boris Johnson, macho ometer David. As, as he's joining GB News, I'd better give him a good score, six. Well done. Company man, keeping your job. Claire, <laughs> Boris, uh, macho ometer uh, That's a zero. Oh, poor this Boris. This is going to get me into so <laughs> much trouble. Uh-oh. Go on. Ten. <gasps> Ten? Because he's naughty, right? Mm. And naughty is a bit saucy. Oh. Mm. Jenny, Trent Sticky. Hughes has just broken the internet. <laughs> Got a lot of anger from her lefty mates <laughs> in Islington nah. and on the barge. Oh. That barge is going to be sunk when you get God. home. OK, listen, we've got to crack on. Um, how about this uh, rather hunky man? <laughs> Look at that. That's well, Nigel Nelson. Well, I think there's a slight bias on the panel here. Yes. Yeah. I think... OK, well, I'm giving him 10 on all of your behalf. Yeah. Ten. Yeah. Ten. Well, okay. you, we, it's got to be 10 from you because you he chose has, him. He's 11. He is. There you go. Aww. He's your husband. He is yeah. Yeah. And last but not least, this ugly thug. Yeah. Ten. 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 I think you're being polite. Ten. No, 10. I think yeah. the car gets 10. I get... Maybe one and a half. Um, listen, thank you for that. The winner was Nigel Nelson, GB News' <laughs> <laughs> political commentator. Oh, thanks for that. Yay! Um, Lucky girl. Then me, <laughs> then me, then Daniel Craig, then Auntie Joshua. OK, uh, listen, look, we've got to crack on now. And apologies, folks, but the clock is against us for your heroes and zeros. Kind of just need a name and a reason briefly, if you can. So your hero of the day, please. My hero of the day was the guy on the South African team who apologised on behalf of... Yeah the other person on his team who said the not nice comment. I think it was a brilliant and healing thing to do. Yep. Great shout. How about your headline hero? It's uh, Bianca Williams, the athlete, holding up a, a ray of light to the bad behaviour of the police. Oh, well done, her. Oh, and David, yeah. your Bobby Charlton, uh, who uh, unfortunately passed away this week. I yes. played football with him in a charity match at Old Trafford. The most skillful player... That, there, there's the picture. This is the picture, it and that's looks, you on the, at the bottom row. Right. Look next to Bobby. Right next and to... He scored two goals direct from corner kicks. Amazing. That, that is some skill. And what a gentleman. Uh, what a gentleman. And can I say, you've got lovely calf muscles. <laughs> I think you're quite macho as well, David. Oh, very okay. yeah. macho in those page, days. A few seconds for your back page zeros. Jenny, who's your zero? The South African player who made the totally inappropriate remark. Correct. Uh, great shout. How about you, Claire? Uh, Rachel Reeves for stealing most of her book from the internet. Most of? Is that a bit harsh? No, no. I think we'll go for a number of pages. Really? A couple of seconds. Is Rishi Sunak going to appoint a female chancellor before the election so that she can't be the first? That would be a very, very petty thing to do. I've heard it's coming, but we'll see. Uh, listen, David, uh, you're uh, back page zero. It's got to be the tube driver who had the people chanting mm. the Pakistani 
chance. I mean, what was he thinking of? Uh, Palestinian, yes. absolutely right. Listen, uh, can I thank my brilliant pundit tonight? You're all heroes to me. Love your company. Please come back again soon. Fascinating debate. And what a great job uh, Jenny Trent Hughes did on her first appearance on Mark Dolan tonight. Listen, we're back tomorrow. Remember, <laughs> brand new time, just for 10 weeks, because John Cleese is my warm-up man. Whoa! There you go. And he's doing 9 till 10, the dinosaur hour. Then it's Mark Dolan's night. See you tomorrow at 10. Headliners is next. Good evening, my name's Rachel Ayres and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. So it's been a pretty unsettled start to the weekend and that's all due to this large area of low pressure out to the west of the UK, bringing some tighter isobars across the north and south, so some stronger winds here as we go into tonight. Heavy rain making its way northwards and bringing some pretty heavy bursts across south southern parts of Wales and southeast England. But we'll see some strong gusty winds too. That rain continuing to make its way north through northern England, northern Ireland and then later into Scotland as we go into the early hours of Sunday. So a pretty gloomy wet start here. Some brighter skies across central and eastern parts of England, but for southern and western coasts, it's another blustery day with frequent showers that could bring the odd rumble of thunder as well as we go into the second part of the weekend. Some sunny spells too and feeling pretty pleasant in the sunshine with highs of 13 to 15. So as we go into the new working week, that rain will continue across eastern Scotland, becoming a little more patchy in nature, though elsewhere it's another day of sunshine and showers. These still most frequent and heaviest across southern and western coasts, and that continuing as we go into the new week. But temperatures starting to drop a little in the north as we go towards midweek. I'm Andrew.